today with Catherine Ruinala. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. I want to share with you a word today that I've been reading um, out of the, the book of Luke, actually. I was in Luke chapter 13. And if you want to turn there with me, I, I hope this encourages you because it, it was a, an encouragement to me to be able to, to look and say, Lord, I want to live a fruitful life. What does a fruitful life look like? I read a quote, it might seem a little dark, but it was a quote from a missionary and a martyr, um, Jim Elliot. And he said, when the time comes to die, make sure all you have to do is die. And I thought that's very good, that we would live purposely, that we would live deliberately, recognizing that it's the goodness and kindness of God that every day that we have is a gift. And I wanna use that every day to give him glory, that my life would give him glory. I wanna live a fruitful life. I wanna live a life that is pleasing to him. And he, I don't have to strive to do that. He wants to lead me if I will learn what it looks like to trust him, to seek him, to obey him in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. All right, Luke chapter 13. If you've got your Bibles, hallelujah. You can grab, grab them and have a look. It's, um, it's beautiful. I'm reading today from the New American Standard Version. Hallelujah. And I'm gonna start here at verse six. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and didn't find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig it around, dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. It's an interesting verse, an interesting parable. And it's not meant... Uh, to be a condemning parable, but it is a sobering parable that says it's so important that we understand to live a life, a Christian life, is more than just having a theory of I have a ticket to heaven because I've asked Jesus to be my saviour. It's actually a life where we are practising what we have received. We are living every day in the salvation God has given us. Uh, Emily at the moment is making sourdough bread. I don't know if you've ever tried to make it. It's so amazing. I'm very proud of her. It's very beautiful. But can you imagine if you, um, if you ordered all the ingredients, you got the starter and you had the, the, all the stuff ready to go and you said, I'm a bread maker, but then you never actually made bread. Are, are you a bread maker? And I believe that's what that scripture is talking about. It says we need to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. But instead of going, oh, am I not doing producing fruit? We need to look to him and recognize that there, we're not called to produce fruit of ourselves, but in him, he who abides in him will produce much fruit, the Bible says. For example, you can look at Mark chapter, where are we? We're back in, if you look in Mark, you can see the, the story where in Mark 11, verse 20, where earlier in the chapter, Jesus had cursed a fig tree that he came across that didn't have any fruit on it. And it wasn't even in season, but he cursed this fig tree. And then a few, uh, like a day later, they were walking past and the disciples remarked, that's so amazing. It says here in verse 20, uh, that he cursed, had, had cursed the fig tree and it had withered up from the roots. So it had withered from the roots up. And, you know, I think that's a, a real key for us, that in order to produce fruit, we have to have a healthy root system. What are we rooted and grounded in? Ephesians 3 says that we're to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. There's another parable, and it's the wise man who built his house upon the rock. You might remember it from Sunday school, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up and the storms beat against the house, but the house on the rock stood firm. It had good, solid roots. 
But to have good roots requires tending. In order to produce fruit requires tending. It requires attention. A, a tree, and I think perhaps this tree, this tree that was cursed, represents a tree that's roots go down into self-righteousness, where I'm trying to be good, I'm trying to do well. But a, a, a root system that's anchored in self-righteousness can produce no abundant fruit, cannot produce lasting fruit. Uh, God says that it's the fruit of righteousness that, that comes when we learn what it looks like to abide in Him, to stare continually at Him, to live and move and have our being in Him. Hallelujah. So good fruit comes from good, healthy roots. Hallelujah. But we, we know that um, if there's unhealthiness in the roots, if there's bitterness or unforgiveness, if there's anger or pride or um, shame, fear, then they manifest in fruits. If you've got fear in your root system, then your responses will be the fruit of fear. If you've got shame in your um, root system, the, the response of that shame, the fruit of that shame will come out in your actions and your responses and your, uh, the way that you live your life. And so God wants us to be careful not to let any bitter root grow, not to allow anything in our lives that's going to cause bitter or unpleasant fruit or unfruitfulness. And so I wanna ask, what are you rooted and grounded in? Now, in salvation, we've been so blessed. We've been set free from sin. The Bible says that when we were saved, that um, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him and by His stripes we're healed. So we have salvation from sin. We are forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Um, our iniquity, our crookedness, which is all the results of sin, everything about us that was crooked and fearful and shameful and every feeling we've had about ourselves. It's, I feel like I'm a hypocrite. I feel shame. I feel fear. I feel hopelessness. All of those things Jesus died to set us free from so that we don't have to wear the fruit of, of sin, that we get a whole new life. We, he is the vine. We are the branches and He is our root. He is the one that we can anchor ourselves in. Hallelujah. And then peace and healing. And this is all the benefits of the magnificent gift of salvation that we have. Hi friends. For so many years I lived with condemnation, frustrated that I didn't fully measure up. Then the Holy Spirit began to reveal the truth that I was loved, set free, and defined by the performance of Jesus, not by my good works. Such a basic truth, but I didn't really understand it. Let me help you fully grasp the goodness of God and how He's designed us to live supernaturally as new creations. Imagine if you were truly supernaturally free from sin and shame, free to follow the desires that God's placed in your heart, in my new book, Supernatural Freedom, I give you simple keys to unlock the freedom that you were designed to live in every day. So we know what sin is. Sin is all the bad things. Lies, jealousy, uh, anger, immorality, ugly things, stealing, slander. Sin is, is, is awful. And God hates sin. But when we sin, praise God, we have an advocate. We have one that we can come to and say, Lord, that was wrong, I'm so sorry. Have mercy on me, forgive me. And He abundantly pardons, praise the Lord. And He doesn't count our sins against us. In fact, He takes them and He doesn't even remember them. He says, I will remember your sin no more. As you repent, turn from your sin and say, I'm sorry, have mercy, forgive me, Lord. He forgives you and He doesn't even remember remember it ever again. He'll never bring it up again. But then when it comes to iniquity, sometimes we struggle to have faith that He's actually taken away the result of sin as well. 
sometimes we struggle with, well, I feel like a hypocrite. Oh God, I know I did that and I know I've repented and I know I've asked for mercy and I've received forgiveness, but I still don't feel like I deserve to be able to, you know, ask you anything. I don't deserve anything. I feel like a hypocrite. Well, the Bible says the effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, that um, that the righteous are as bold as lions. So the enemy loves for you to hold on to shame. He loves for you to hold on to hip, you know, the sense that you're a hypocrite. Because if you believe that, then you won't pray effective and powerful prayers. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be ashamed like Adam and Eve were in the garden. They hid themselves from God. You won't feel confident to approach Him in prayer. and You'll find other things to do, even though you know you should. And then you'll get more condemned because you feel like you should be praying, but you're not really spending much time in prayer. But actually the root of it all is a, is a deep sense of shame. And God wants to set you free from that shame because the fruit of not having shame in your life is a bold, free, happy prayer life where you boldly come before the throne of grace, hallelujah. And He wants to set us free from that, that ugly slime of the lie of the enemy that wants to say hypocrite, but you go, I am a hypocrite, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. Hey, well, you shouldn't have done that. Repent, ask for forgiveness. But the moment you do and by faith believe He forgives you, then the Bible says that even if your heart condemns you, He is greater than your heart. In other words, He is better than you feel like you deserve and you need to have faith to believe that He has taken away your iniquity. He's taken away the identity that came through that sin. And He is so kind, our wonderful Jesus, hallelujah. He doesn't remember your sin anymore, so you shouldn't either. And so we've gotta be careful not to buy into the enemy's lie that would try to undermine your confidence. He's, but the Bible tells us don't throw away your confidence because your confidence is something that comes from the fact that you have one who loves you so much that he has dealt with your sin. As you give it to him, as you repent and receive mercy, he calls you blameless, pure, righteous, holy. And even if you don't feel like it, if you'll believe it by faith, then you can start to approach Him boldly and confidently in prayer, hallelujah. And you can pray knowing that He's listening. You can ask Him questions with an expectation that He'll speak to you. And you can enter into this beautiful fellowship where you have a friendship with God. People might get upset and say, well, He's a holy God. Don't talk about being friends with God. But you know, He is holy, He is glorious, He's amazing. He's, he's so far above every other name. And we aren't worthy, but He has come and He has given us mercy and He has made us holy. And His whole delight and pleasure is for you to believe that He has given you clean garments, a new heart. He has taken away your sin, given you His righteousness, and He longs to have fellowship with you. He created mankind so that He could have fellowship with Him. He created men and women in His image deliberately so that he would have a counterpart to have fellowship with. He loves your friendship. And I, I always get amazed at the kindness of God, at the wisdom of God. Who would like a friend that is so wise that he is always right? And in fact, he knows about things you have no idea about. I constantly find this. God will say, don't do that. And then I'll find out later, oh, I shouldn't have done that because of this and then I'll think, God, I'm sorry, why didn't I listen to you? And he'll smile and I'll know it was only for my good that he was saying, don't do that. He is such a good, kind friend. And so I go on the journey of saying, Lord, I'm sorry I didn't trust you with that, but thank you, Lord, I know I trust you even more now, knowing I can hold your hand and help me to listen more, help me to be obedient quickly, help me to trust you. And he doesn't get frustrated He's just so patient and he wants to help you consistently all the time. But that help will only come as you deal with the root of shame that the enemy would like to sow into your root system. Hallelujah. He wants to set us free from all the, all the bad roots so that we can 
um, bring up beautiful fruit and, and live in a, a fruitful, abundant life. Fear is another one. Fear is something that can just sit there in the root system and eat away at you. But you can tell the fruit of fear. It's self-defense and selfishness and, and um, you can look at your actions and your responses and very often it's rooted in fear. And fear is the opposite of love because the Bible tells us that perfect love casts out fear. So he doesn't slam you and say, you terrible people, why are you so afraid? He says, come to me. He says, fear not. And he says, I want to let my perfect love cast out all your fears. The scripture tells us, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I've learned to pray very honest prayers with God. When I get honest with him and I say, Lord, I'm nervous about this, I'm scared about this. Lord, I bring you my fear. I open my heart with an expectation and a faith that I know he wants to fill that place with his perfect love. He wants to fill that place with his perfect peace. He wants to speak a word to me that will steady me and cast out fear. For fear is a spirit. It wants to grip you and it wants to influence your life. But God wants to set you free from fear. And the only way you can do that is you, by letting his love displace it. So it, it's letting him make you lie down in green pastures so he can restore your soul. Where you come and say, oh, I'm feeling a bit stressed, I'm feeling a bit anxious, feeling a bit worried about this. God, here it is, I bring you my heart. Come Lord and restore my soul. What he's doing there is he's tending and fertilizing and, and looking after the root system and filling you with love so that you'll be rooted and established in his love so that you can overflow with the fruit of the Spirit, with the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, God who is love. Love is patient, love is kind, keeps no record of wrongs. All those wonderful definitions of love are what you'll see come out of your life if you'll make a habit of humbling yourself and saying, I need help. I wanna talk to you about this, God, help me. And come in faith, believing he will, and he will. And he does, and it's my secret, hallelujah, our wonderful, patient, faithful Father. He wants us also to be free um, from any, any sense of pride that might be in there. I used to worry about this a lot though. I remember as a teenager, I'd be at the altar going, oh God, I'm so proud, help me not to be proud. And so I was afraid of being pride, prideful because I knew pride came before a fall and I don't want to be prideful. Oh God, help me out. And, um, and I, I was always worried and fearful that there might be some pride left in me. But you see, the good news is when we understand the gospel, we can reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin and alive to God in Christ. So instead of trying to deal with pride in our life, we come and we humble ourselves and say, Lord, I thank you, there's nothing good in me. I give you my life and today I receive by faith your life. Today I reckon, I reckon myself dead indeed to sin. I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer Catherine who lives, but Christ who lives in Catherine. And therefore, are you proud? No. You aren't, you, I have the motives of Christ. And, and then I step in and live out of that place of Christ's humility, Christ's character. And instead of trying to figure out, am I this or am I that? I remember, thank you God, he set me free from self. He set me free from me. Hooray, yay, the world can celebrate. God set you free from you. God set me free from me. So I just need to remind myself. I need to look in the mirror of his face. James chapter one tells us, if any man's a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's because he's like a man who looked at his natural face in the mirror and then walked away and forgot what he looked like. So instead, we need to look in the mirror of his face and say, okay, no longer me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. What's he like? Oh, he's holy, <laughs> he's so wise, he's kind, he's patient, he's long suffering, he doesn't keep any record of wrongs. That's who you are, this is who you are. All the fruits of the Spirit are who you are. And that's not a measure that I have to try and live up to, it's actually my identity. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As I receive it, I'm gonna 
put on by faith this superpower of love, joy, peace. I'm gonna put it on today and I'm gonna live in it. I'm not gonna just have the ingredients for sourdough bread, I'm gonna make it. <laughs> I'm not gonna just have technically peace and let it sit there. I'm gonna put it on like a superpower. I'm gonna put on the superpower of peace. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, temperance, goodness, faith, meekness. I'm gonna put it all on. And I'm gonna live it out today, not because I'm trying to do it out of self-righteousness or, or dead works, which is an unhealthy root system that won't produce fruit, but I'm gonna do it out of the place where I'm, I reckon myself dead by faith to sin and alive in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna reckon myself, hallelujah, crucified with Christ. No longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And that's not even something I have to do by my works. I can't crucify myself by my works. It's something that has to happen by faith. By faith, I, I identify with your death, your burial and your resurrection today. And I'm gonna say, you're greater than my heart. You're better than I feel like I deserve, hallelujah. And when you do that, you can have confidence because your confidence isn't in your ability, it's in his nature, hallelujah our wonderful Jesus. So, what are your roots? What, what are you allowing to tick away in the background? God wants you to expose it all to Him and say, here it is, God, get honest, get real with Him. Repent of any bitterness, repent of any unforgiveness. If you've got unforgiveness, you can tell, or fear, you can tell by the way that you'll speak, by the way that you'll respond. And when you do, then go to the Lord and say, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, help me. Thank you that you've given me forgiveness. Oh God, thank you that you've given me forgiveness. God, you've forgiven me of so many things. Thank you, Lord, I received that as a free gift and I'm so grateful and you forgive and you forget. So Father, you said freely I've received, freely I can give. So I give forgiveness. Forgiveness like you give me. Forgiveness that forgives and forgets. <laughs> forgives and forgets, hallelujah. That's the gift I'm able to give away to other people, hallelujah. And then we can live free, hallelujah. It's, it's the opportunity. If there's any bitterness or anger or sense of revenge or injustice in our hearts and you wanna, you wanna get revenge. The Bible says that um, vengeance is His. He says, don't, don't seek vengeance, don't seek to take revenge, but bless those that curse you. Do good to those who spitefully use you and bless them, forgive them just as I forgive you. And, and he tells us that our reward in heaven will be so great when we do that, hallelujah. And then we can also make sure that we're looking after our own lives and become fruitful and not producing fruit that's snuck in through unforgiveness or bitterness or fear or pride or shame or any of those things that might try to uh, muddy the waters and cause unhappiness. You know, it's so wonderful that He's forgiven us of our sin. But it's so much more than just a ticket to heaven when you die. It's our opportunity to live fruitful lives every day. Now, our lives are like a breath. Tomorrow isn't guaranteed, but today is a gift. Hallelujah. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. My prayer for you is that you would recognize the day, the life that God's given you, and that tomorrow as you wake up, or today, as you, as you listen to this, as you hear this message, you'd say to the Lord, God, today, I wanna surrender my life to you, Jesus. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and that He died and rose again. And Lord, I need mercy. You said all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. So God, I need forgiveness and I believe Jesus paid the price for my sin on the cross when He died. And Lord, I thank You, I receive by faith in humility the gift of forgiveness, the forgiveness that takes away my sin and doesn't remember it anymore. And now today I'm gonna put on the garments of salvation. I'm gonna put on love, joy, 
peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Thank you, Father, that there's no limit to any of those things, Lord, in my life, because I thank you by grace through faith, I've received salvation. If you've never prayed that prayer, I'd love to pray that prayer with you today. Would you pray this after me? Father God, I believe that Jesus died and rose again, that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he paid the price for all of my sin. Have mercy on me, Lord. I need forgiveness. Forgive me for all of my sin. I give it to you and I receive your grace, your mercy, your righteousness. Come into my life. Give me eternal life. Fill me with your spirit. And Lord, now help me to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Help me to live holding your hand. I acknowledge I can't do it in my own strength. I need your help and I want my life to be fruitful. So help me to live a life that is pleasing to you, that is worthy of your death, death, burial and resurrection. Help me, Jesus, in the precious and the holy name of Jesus, amen.